It's one of the most quoted books of the New Testament, with passages in tons of songs, greeting cards, quite possibly painted on the walls of your gym. That's right, it's Philippians. Why did Nero put Paul in jail? Is there a catfight between two women in the church? And how can Paul talk about having joy in the midst of suffering? We're going to be talking about all of that and more on today's episode of Theology on Air. So welcome back to Theology on Air. We are an offshoot of a ministry called Theology on Tap here in Houston for young adults where we come together over craft beer and food and talk about theology and philosophy and faith and culture and politics and all kinds of juicy stuff. But we get to dive even deeper here in the podcast. So thank you for joining us and, um, you know, like us and love us and worship us online. I'm joking about that last part, but a good review or sharing this with a friend would go a long way for us on whatever podcast platform you listen. Um, and then any detail you need about Houston's Theology on Tap, uh, you can find at houstontot.com. So that's all of our, like, you know, annoying logistic kind of stuff. But I'm joined, as usual, uh, by Evan McClanahan. He's the senior pastor here at First Lutheran in Midtown. And I am Sarah Stone. I'm the Young Adults uh, Outreach Director at Memorial Drive Presbyterian Church on the West Side. And we are joined today by our very special guest, David Capes. Welcome, David. Thank you. Good to be here. Uh, David is the director of the Lanier Theological Library in Houston, Texas. If you guys have not been, you should check it out. If nothing more than for the bunnies that prance around all over yeah, the campus. Yeah, but That's watch out cute. because they do get under your car sometimes. I know. And you have to be careful when you We're back always out. careful. We're yes, lovers. Good. My daughter loves bunnies. So. But uh, but David, prior to being at Lanier, um, was the dean of the School of Biblical and Theological Studies at Wheaton College <laughs> in Wheaton, Illinois. He's the author, co-author, editor, and co-editor of 14 books, including Rediscovering Paul and the Divine Christ. And he and his wife, Kathy, live in North Houston. That's so, right. So glad that you're here. Thank glad you. to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah. Oh, I'm excited about it. Yeah. So as you, maybe you know, if you've been listening to our podcast, we try something like once a month to just dive into the actual Bible. <laughs> what does it say? What's it about? What themes do we find? What tricky verses are there? Um, and we've been going through some books. We're in the New Testament now. We spent some time in the Old Testament. And the last one we did was on First Peter. That was a really good one. Um, so we're kind of going backwards a little bit, and we're tackling Philippians today. I asked David. David loves Paul, and he's done a fair amount of writing. And so I asked him what book of the Bible he wanted to tackle, and he said Philippians. So tell us a little bit about you, who you are, your story, and then why Philippians? Why did that even make the cut? Oh, okay. Um, okay. My name is David Capes. Um, I am uh, married to Kathy for 45 years next week, wow. actually. Aww. Congratulations. Yes, we married awesome. 12 years old. We were 12. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> no, it was it was a long time ago, but um, we've been together. We have we have three boys, okay. three, three adult sons, um, but one of them I no longer see because he died uh, three years ago. Oh, he he had gosh. a very aggressive form of cancer. And he passed away, and it was uh, it has been one of the most difficult things we've ever been through. Yeah. Um, but um, I'm really sorry to hear he, that. Yeah. He, uh, I've, I'm, in terms of suffering, we're learning a lot about that. Yep. Uh, I've got three grandkids. So those kind of the family side of me. Uh, I love Paul because uh, I had a Bible teacher years ago, a guy named Daniel DeHaan. In fact, I named my son Dan, Daniel, after Dan, when mm. Daniel's plane went down in North um, Alabama. He was 33 years old. Oh my goodness! Death. But he was a wonderful Bible teacher. He was a mentor to me, and he loved Paul too. He did a whole series on Paul, and he called it. Now this is the day of cassette tapes. Okay, right? Yeah, yeah. Cassette tapes. I've heard of it. His whole, his whole. It, it was in this wonderful uh, sort of binder. Hangeth thou in there, O baby, is what it, he called it. <laughs> what? Yeah, hangeth. It's the King James, I guess. Hangeth <laughs> thou in there, O baby, and it was about Paul and how Paul was hanging in there through very tough circumstances. Circumstances and obviously, the Philippians got a lot of play in that particular series of yeah. of, of talks that he did. So I, I love Philippians because they, it's a short book too. It's four. four it's nice, an easy read. It's easy read compared yeah. to Romans. Yeah, compared to First Corinthians or Hebrews, something like yeah. that, which is a bit tougher. But um, it, it's something I felt like we could handle in a shorter <laughs> period of time. But I'm an academic. I've taught in uh, for 25 years at Houston Baptist University, Ooh, Greek and New Testament. I was the founding dean of the Honors College there wow, back very years cool. ago and uh, 
just love and miss a little bit of the academics working for the library. Yeah. But the library is an amazing place. We hope you'll come and see it. It I describe it as a little piece of Oxford that broke off and fell in, in Houston. And he actually really means that. Like it looks like it. There's cobblestone pathways. Yeah. It looks like you are in a in a different country. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just like conceptually or philosophically or something. It's like, no, it really yeah. looks like it. it's beautiful. Although we're, we're not really in the business of being a film location. We had a film crew there yesterday. A part of the film that they want to do is, is in England. Mm. That they'll be dropping their son off at a prep school kind of thing. So, so they were looking at our location as a possibility. That's cool. yeah, it's yeah. kind of cool. But it does look like that. You yeah. know? And it, it is a very impressive uh, library. A theological mm -hmm. library, hundred thousand volumes, and it's a wonderful collection, wonderful people. Mm -hmm. People come from all over really to study there. Well, and yeah. you guys do a like a lecture series up into a couple of those where, yeah, yeah. um, and those are those are great. Yeah. Uh, we have so. NT Wright coming, and, and I haven't heard of him. You ever heard? Of him? I'm joking. I'm joking. I'll, I'll no, start I, I have a whole list of books you ought to read then. We just no, call no, him no. Tom here. Tom. That's right. We, right. Do, Good old T dog. Yeah, yeah, Tom. Yeah, Tom. <laughs> Yes, uh, he uh, he he went he went without alcohol over Lent. Did you know that? I mean, who didn't? I feel like that I mean, I'm not saying the, he's that not was special. The sort of thing, but, a sort of thing. Yeah, I, it's a thing. I, when I saw him a couple of weeks ago, he you know in Oxford, he was we had a, drunk. A, 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 I'm joking. No, no, I'm joking. No, he was not. No, he was not. He was <laughs> sorry. And I said, "Would you like a glass of wine?" Because I know he likes that. Yeah. Kind of thing, and he said, "No, it's Lent, and I'm can't wait for Jesus to get out of that." Oh my gosh. That's it. No, he didn't say that. But that's, I've actually right. heard him and um, Francis Collins do a guitar duet where they took the words of a Beatles song out yes. and redid it about like creation or something. I mean, it was yeah. so as it was happening, I was like, what is my life right now? What surreal moment <laughs> am I in? You know, it was fantastic. Well, well, Collins is a really um, good guitar player. Tom describes himself as a kind of a mediocre yeah, yeah. player. But he he can do okay. But Tom's uh, Francis is actually the better guitar player. Well, either way, just to see two people that are just so revered and sort of in the academic and pastoral world bust out instruments and sing, know, it was fun. Yeah, but it was fun. But we digress. Yes. We uh, so okay. So the situate us a little bit in the book of okay. Philippians. Like, okay. who's who is writing it? Who's he writing it to? Where is he writing it from? What's it about? What are some kind of overarching things we can say about it before we dive into okay. more? Well, you know, New Testament contains a lot of letters, and, mm -hmm. and 13 of those are attributed to Paul. Now, scholars are going to be debating, you know, well, did Paul really write this, and what is it? But but one of the big questions is, what does it mean to write a letter in the first century, right? Mm. Is that there's an image of Rembrandt that's a very famous Im uh, image of Paul supposedly sitting at a, at a desk, uh, writing, there are books open there. He, he has his head in his hand. He's mm -hmm. thinking, and he's got a. He's, he's writing there, and in the corner there is this ubiquitous sword. Whenever you see an image of Paul in the Middle Ages, there's the sword. It's almost in the background. You don't. People don't typically see it, hmm. uh, but it, but that it's there to remind you that he was beheaded. That he was a martyr. So that's with a sword in the side. So you see that. Yeah, it's really, really kind of an interesting feature. But that has nothing to do with the way that Paul actually wrote letters. Mm -hmm. um, if you begin the book of Philippians, he says Paul and Timothy. Um, there, are, Paul is a writer and Timothy is a co-writer with him mm -hmm. in the book. And he, he's a sender. It, typically in a Greco-Roman letter, and that's what the style Paul is writing in, you have the designation of the sender followed by the recipients. We don't do mm -hmm. it that way, mm -hmm. obviously. But, but so here Paul is writing with Timothy. We don't know exactly what Timothy provided, what he offered, but he's a co-writer with Paul. So Paul's letters are not just Paul sitting down at a desk, thinking through things and trying to sort things out. He's actually writing in a community of people. And, and I think bouncing things off of other people mm -hmm. as he's writing, saying, I'm getting ready to send a letter to these Philippian folks. This is what I'm saying. What do you think about it? Is that clear? Yeah. What do you so want to put in here? Getting, yeah. Yeah. Clear. And, and we also know from other places that Paul used a secretary to write. An amanuensis. Amanuensis. You got yeah. that in amanuensis. It's a fun and word to say. So it is. It's a Greek word. It doesn't mean secretary in the sense that we mean an administrative assistant these days. Yeah, yeah. Right. It is, um, it is, uh, th these were scribes. These were people usually sometimes hired who <laughs> came from the marketplace and came and sat down on wax tablets. They, they didn't have desks in those days. 
um, they, they, they had a tunic and they'd spread their tunic out really tightly over mm. their legs and they would write on these wax tablets. Man, wax. They, Ikea met, could have made a killing back then. <laughs> Huh? Yeah. Ikea could have made a killing back then. They really could. They could have sold a lot yeah. of gas yeah. in those days. Yeah. So, to jails, mostly. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and in this particular case, Paul is in prison, yeah. right? But he's not in prison. Uh, there's two kinds of prisons mm -hmm. in, the, in the Roman world. One is sort of you're under the earth, right? You're thrown <laughs> into a hole. The other is more like house arrest, mm -hmm. and, which is the case here. Paul is under what's called, what could be called house arrest. Had an ankle and, bracelet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, grounded yeah, yeah. from all social yeah, media. Yeah, okay, yeah, let me stop. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we know some people like that. I think, but um, he he is there, and people can come and see him, but they also have to come and support him because the Romans wouldn't provide his meals. They wouldn't, you know, it's not not like today. Wouldn't hmm. wouldn't you know pay for his cable television? None Three hots and a cot. Yeah, none yeah, of that. You don't get that. You, hmm. Maybe maybe a cot, but. Um, he had to have friends bring him meals. And so he's in Rome, which is a place he's never been before, probably. He could have been in Ephesus. There's actually a very strong case that instead of being in Rome, as he's writing this, that he's writing from an Ephesian imprisonment. Mm. And part of the reason is because there's clearly some rapid movement back and forth between Philippi and, and F, maybe Ephesus. Um, to go to Rome, Rome was a lot further away. It was a sea trip. And there were only certain months of the year when you could actually get on the sea. Hmm. So half of the year you, you couldn't get on the, 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 the Mediterranean simply because it was too dangerous. Yeah. Storms, hot air from Africa, cold air from the north, storms, and a lot of ships went down. So you had to be really careful. So if, if it's, it's possible, I still am convinced by the Roman imprisonment idea, but I still think it's possible. Yeah. That Paul might have been in prison. He was in prison everywhere. Right? I know. Yeah, he didn't have he the went, easiest was, life, it turns out, once he started following Jesus. Yeah, that's sort of the, the way it went, right? Yeah. But Jesus said it was going to be that way. I know. If it was a fair, me, it was like an informed consent situation. Like, you know what you're getting into. Right. It still is. Yeah. It still is so, today. So Paul a, and Timothy as okay. the writers here. And they're writing to the people at the church. It's in Philippi. In Philippi, which is... Which is a kind of north northern Greece mm -hmm. um, on what we call his second missionary journey. Yeah, Paul founded the church, and one of the ways that Paul, um, a part of Paul's missionary strategy, was to try to revisit churches when he could. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, there's, for example, he's probably in Galatian churches two or three times at least. Uh, he tried to go back to churches, and if he couldn't go, he would send a letter. Mm -hmm. Or he would send, in some cases, somebody like Timothy a person, or a yeah. person to be his representative. And then when he couldn't do that, he would usually send a letter. So the letters are a way of extending his presence, though he's not present, but he's, his words, his mm -hmm. ideas are still present with them. So, so his letters are a substitute for his physical presence. He can't be there because he's in prison. Gotcha. Yeah. The church at Philippi, I don't want to take this too far into a tangent, but I have to ask because I'm curious what you'll have to say about this. Do we think it was started in part by Lydia? Absolutely. Lydia was at the heart of it. I mean, yeah. I think at the very heart of it. Um, when you look at the book of Acts, I think it's chapter 16. It is. I uh, pulled it up. Paul, yeah. Oh, you did. Then, then um, what Paul typically did when he went to a city is he would look for a synagogue because mm -hmm. he was a Jew. And because he was a kind of like a visiting rabbi, they would be, he would be invited to speak. You know, today we have Rabbi Saul from Tarsus, you know, he's yeah. going to speak to us. So he would be invited to do that. And then he would have an opportunity to speak about Jesus. <laughs> this so, just in, there's more to the story. Yeah. yeah. He, he didn't, he didn't look for the atheist convention and say, <laughs> let me, let me speak to these people. He, he started with people that, it, with whom he had a lot in common mm -hmm. and he would build common ground and he would do, now at times he would get thrown out of the synagogues and such. And so he would turn, quote, then to the Gentiles. But usually the Gentiles, who were the hangers on mm -hmm. to the synagogue, people who were hanging around and pretty curious about it. And why are, why are you guys monotheists? And why are you guys not eat pork? And, mm -hmm. you know, they, they were curious about a lot of things. So he goes to look for a synagogue. Right. And, it's not there. And there's none there. Right. But there are right. some women gathered by the sea. Right. And yeah. he starts chatting with them. And, um, and so Lydia was Jewish, but kind of curious about things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. 
she's converted. She believes and she, she believer follows. In Jesus. And then she invites the disciples back to her house. I guess she was very wealthy, dealer in purple cloth, all that. Yeah, she's um, a businesswoman. Yeah. Right? So she was a woman of some means and probably becomes a patron to the church in some ways. By the way, fun fact, she's from Thyatira, which is one of the churches that in Revelation that gets a letter. Yeah. You know, anyway, I think that's cool. one of the so seven letters. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Anyway. Well, uh, I mean, normally uh, in Jewish tradition, to have a synagogue, you had to have 10 Jewish men. Yeah. It's called a minion. Now today, with the liberalizing and progressive stuff, it could be 10 Jewish people. Okay. Typically. Depends, yeah. on, depends on the tradition. If it's Orthodox, no. But if it's Reform, yes. Uh, I mean, in none those of us days, are biologists, so. Do what now? <laughs> no. I said none of us are biologists anyway, so, you know. That's right. Who could tell? Who's yeah. to say? Yeah. Who's to know? Sorry. Exactly. Sorry. <laughs> Ten Jewish persons. <laughs> oh, Ten Jewish persons. Oh, gosh. But, but there were some Jewish women who were there yeah. who maybe their husbands were, um, maybe they were married, you know, outside the faith or something. Mm-hmm. We just don't know. We don't yeah. know much about the story. But but Paul Paul and, and his traveling companion, Paul almost always went somewhere with somebody, right? He very seldom traveled on his own to a place. Traveling was dangerous. Uh, it was it was it was long. It was by foot usually, or it was on a boat. So when you look at all the miles he racked up, it's insane. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, he must have had really huge legs, you know, <laughs> big calves and, and all his good companions glutes. also mm. had to have t- long legs. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so we've got Lydia et al. Mm-hmm. starting this church and now he's writing back to them because they've, you know, they're growing. They're growing. What are some of the things he's writing to them that are like, what are some sort of themes or main big ideas here that he's writing to them? Yeah. I mean, uh, there's, there's a number of things. You talked about the cat fight a little yeah. bit earlier. I mean, he is trying to write to bring about unity mm-hmm. in the church. And one of the most impressive passages in all of Paul's letters is found in chapter two, where he, he begins to appeal to them to be, if, if, can I read part of, of it? Okay. Mm-hmm. We right, allow so scripture reading you allow theology okay. on yeah, air. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, this is the new <laughs> Revised Standard Version, which I'm not wed to, but it's a good good translation. And I happen to have written some essays in this. So anyway, I have it with me. I like um, it. Yeah. It's the Baylor, can I? Yeah. yeah of course Baylor can. annotated uh, study Bible. Anyway. Awesome. Um, so anyway, it, he says it, in chapter two, and this is just one of the things. I mean, there's several big, mm-hmm. big ideas. If there's any encouragement in Christ, and obviously there is, <laughs> if there's any consolation from love, indeed there is. If there's any sharing in the spirit, participation in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, and all of those would be answered, yes, there is. Then Paul goes on to say, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and having one mind doing nothing, not a, not one thing <laughs> from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. And then he goes on to say, let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And then he gives us this wonderful hymn from the early church that describes the story of Jesus. Michael Gorman calls it the master story, hmm. where there's this katabasis, this Greek word meaning there's this descent of Jesus in his humility. Uh, Larry Hurtado describes this as Jesus as being the lordly example. Most lords would demand people fall down before them mm-hmm. and just, you know, genuflect and your head cannot be higher than mine and you must mm-hmm. pay me honor. Most lords in the ancient world were like that. But Jesus is this lord who humbles himself mm-hmm. and he leaves behind. He doesn't insist on being called uh, by, by the name that he had, he earned and it, the, by the name that he was. But he humbled himself even to the point of death, right? Mm-hmm. And then and then there's this anabasis, which it means uh, the ascent, which is where God super exalts him and gives him a name that is above every name. Oh, I love that. It's an amazing hymn. So Jesus becomes the lordly example of the kind of humility. And Paul says, have that same mind. Uh, don't look out for your own interest. Don't look out for the interest of others. Don't regard yourself as better than somebody else. Regard them as better than you, in a sense. I love Turn the humiliation around. and then exaltation. Yeah. 
And that's the pattern he's asking us to follow. Like yeah. we're in the humiliation mm-hmm. phase right now. Like right. we're in the, in humbling the true phase. sense of that word, not like being embarrassed, but just yeah. humbling yourself. Humble yourself. Humble yeah. yourself before before God, before one another. Uh, regard each other with honor. Seek to have the same mind. Mm-hmm. And, and that's really a very powerful and important piece of this letter. Yeah. Uh, the, because there's discord. I mean, every church whether it's 10 or 20 or 50 or 100, is going to have some discord in it. Mm-hmm. And so everybody wants their ideas, you know. Yeah. yeah. And wants their, I've got the best idea. Well, maybe best you Best carpet color. You know, yeah. yeah. Maybe you don't. We maybe. took all the carpet out. Makes makes life a lot easier. Yeah, just hard. I love the hardwood floors. One less, one less thing to fight about. Um, I want to ask about the, the humiliation because yeah. there yeah. has been, uh, and I think still to a degree, is a, a bit of a controversy. Uh, around the this the, and I don't fully understand it, but it's essentially about the eternal subordination of the Son, the right. the, the idea that yeah. Jesus is lesser in a sense than the Father, that you know even yeah. within the the Godhead, the Trinity, that the Father plays a kind of supreme role. Um, and I believe this is one of the texts that people would look to to say that yeah, some people do. Yeah. 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 Do, you, do you have any? I mean, yeah, I, I, I I don't understand that. I've never held to that. But do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, I think, yeah, I, I do. A friend of mine, Michael, uh, Mike Bird, lives in, in the other side of the world in Australia, has written about that, has written a nice little book about that. Um, there are passages that can be interpreted that way. But what I think the better way to look at it is to say that within the Trinity itself, there is this communion that goes on. Right, mm-hmm. a communion, and 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 what communion means is common union. This mm-hmm. common union. So you bring those two words together. There's this common union between them, but there is this deference. I think that the son pays to the father, mm-hmm. and that deference is reflected in passages like this, mm-hmm. and in passages like John, where Jesus says, "I only do what the father tells me mm-hmm. to do. I only say what the father tells me to say." Kind of stuff. So there's this natural, and and this is the kind of attitude that that people are, um, or that Paul is hoping the people of Philippi is going to take on the same mm-hmm. kind of attitude. It, but it doesn't seem like Paul's trying to make a point about the interior economic workings of the Trinity. He's not. He's, no, I yeah. don't think he is. I think he's telling, he's he's t- declaring this hymn, yeah. and he's he's using Jesus as an example of what it looks like to humble yourself with sort of an implicit promise that if we humble ourselves, God will exalt us. And later in the same in this letter in Philippians three twenty, Paul says, you know, our citizenship is not in heaven, mm-hmm. but we are eagerly awaiting a Savior. Jesus Christ, our Lord, who will change this body that we're humbling into the glorious body like his. So there's there's this implicit promise that in our humbling, that one day we will be exalted mm-hmm. as well. Now, we're not exalted and given the name that is above every name, right. and every knee does not bow to us, those kind of things. But this is a brilliant passage. And there's there's I often go to churches and hear people, you know, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. You know, <laughs> things like that. And let's sing. The name Jesus. Let's sing together. Um, but the name is not Jesus. Mm-hmm. You know, Jesus was a very common name in those days. Yeah. The people who've done studies of names in Galilee at that time tell us about one out of every 13 boys was named Jesus. So there were a lot of, it's Joshua is the name. Yeah, Joshua, right, Yeshua. Yeah. So Yeshua, he's running around. So it's not the name Jesus, but it's the name that is above every name. That is the name of God, the unspeakable, ineffable name of God. Hmm. Now is the name that belongs to Jesus. And the translation of that into Greek is the word Lord, where we get the word Lord. Hmm. That's how we translate it. Mm-hmm. So at the, at, the, at the very end of the hymn, he says, so that every knee bows, every tongue confesses mm-hmm. that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord. Yeah. And that's that's in effect God's name. Yeah. Is his. Oh, I love so that. He shares his name. God is God is he's so intimate with Jesus that yeah. to call him Lord yeah. is to the glory of God the Father. And that's how the hymn ends. Yeah. All of this, this exaltation of Jesus to the highest place is to the glory of God the Father. Are you thinking the same thing I'm thinking? I bet we're going to ask know. the same question. You go. Go. Well, let's find out. So la- just last night. Yes, we are. That's okay. so funny. Okay. Well, just last night we had uh, someone who, who had sort of in the deconstructionist camp. Mm-hmm. You've heard that phrase. But anyway, sure. um, 
you know, he, he argued, it was kind of on the topic of the exclusivity of Christ and, and it sort of hopeful universalism. Maybe all will be saved. And he said, well, hey, you know, every knee bends. And my argument is, well, just because every knee bends to Christ to the, as Lord doesn't mean that all will be saved. Those are different sort of categories. Yeah, there's two so. different categories. Yeah, okay. you, you can bend in, in honor. Um, I mean, in the ancient world, uh, people bent over in honor and, and in a sense, reverence and homage, paying homage, but they also bent over in surrender. Mm. So some, um, you know, apparently are going to bow the knee and surrender. And we've seen that. I mean, I remember looking at, at images from the first Gulf War of uh, Iraqi soldiers giving up and just getting down on their knees mm. to American soldiers, you know, and, mm. and such. So I, I think the bending of the knee is one of those things that has a, a very, um, there are several layers to it. Mm -hmm. It's not just sort of one idea. Yeah. Uh, Agreed. Yeah. I mean, that was kind of our take yesterday too, but I thought it was interesting that it was used for this more universalistic yeah. approach. But yeah. let's, let's just look at a couple uh, verses or passages okay. from Philippians okay, that cool. are either really well known, maybe misused or need some unpacking. Okay. okay. Probably. Excuse me. Probably the most well-known uh, verse is the "I can do all things through Christ who gives I'm me strength." I'm so glad you brought that up. And uh, I've always been annoyed that um, that this it's, gets it's used. It's on basketball sneakers now. Yes, it's yeah. it's is on it really okay. yes, at the YMCA. Yeah. It's often on the the walls. Yeah. Which I mean, love the YMCA for putting scripture on the walls. That's yep. cool. Yep. But but then people are like, ah, this is the Lord's strength. Oh, you know. And then they're lifting more weight, like. Jesus, right. give me strength. Right. And of course, I don't think that's necessarily what he's talking about. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong. No. What are your thoughts? Well, it is. Uh, when, when people Google verses <laughs> for the Bible, this is one of the top three verses they, hmm. they Google. One, John 3, 16. Yeah. And then uh, there's one, I think, from Jeremiah. 29, 29, 11. 29, 11. 29, 11. Yeah. yeah, that one. And then in this, this verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Here's the problem with that translation. The word do is actually not in the original language. Hmm. Okay. All right. So, um, so you're saying the ESV has lied to me. <laughs> well, it hasn't lied to you, but what I tell you, in fact, I was just chatting recently with one of the people on the translation committee to the NIV. Hmm. What happens in translation, and this is very difficult, is to try to overcome sort of the gravity and the weight of past translations. Hmm. So even starting with the King James Version, people have a hard time um, moving off of center from that. And so those translations very often will continue to exercise weight. But if you look at really good commentaries and really uh, excellent that deal with the language that Paul is and what Paul's onto here, I think the best way to understand, well, let me, let me put it this way. Um, literally, oh, well, let me, let me see the Greek here. Hold on. <laughs> Yeah, These are the kinds of nerdy guests okay. that we have on this show. They bring their Greek I'm super nerdy Bibles, and they actually know how to read them. Um, <laughs> it's, it's all uh, Greek to me. Yeah. It's, I have uh, to. I know it was terrible, but I had to say it. <laughs> uh, Philippians 4.13. Okay, here's, here's, here's what it says literally. Um, in, in reference to all things, I am able by the one who empowers me. Now, here's the question. I am able to what? Oh, I know. Okay. I think it's in the verses beforehand. Exactly. That's Boom. where you Do draw I win? It. You win. You win the prize. <laughs> I'm exalted so the, already. So the stop. verses beforehand are all about what? Oh, I have to go back. Basically being content and having yeah. joy in these crappy situations. Exactly. I think yeah. what Paul is saying is not, you know, I can leap tall buildings with a single bound. Sure. He's not saying I can, I can do. I am able to be content in any and every situation by the power of the one who is in me, mm -hmm. right? And he's referring here to Christ. Now, when you think about that, that's not quite as cool, right? I want to I want to do stuff. Right? I don't know. Being content in a crappy situation Being is pretty impossible. Being content is impossible. It is the unnatural state of mm -hmm. affairs. Mm -hmm. Thoreau wrote, the mass of men live lives of quiet desperation, mm -hmm. right? And I think that was a brilliant sentence. I think mm -hmm. he's right, that the, the natural state of affairs for us is discontent, desperation yep. for human beings, okay? Which leads to all kinds of crap, okay? You can say that, yeah, because I, can, I, I that said here? it. Okay, <laughs> and, and it, it leads to murder, it yeah. leads to violence, it leads to divorce. self It leads to, yeah. yeah, all kinds of things. So if if the power of contentment is, is amazing yeah. to be in prison and to be content with that situation, 
and to be able to find good in that situation. Mm -hmm. And Paul has had times when he was on top and when he was on bottom and times back and forth. And that's got to be really hard. If I can stay on bottom and just stay on bottom, geek content, that's one thing. But to have it all. And to know what it was like. To yeah. know what it was like. Yeah. To have all that and then to give it up. So I think a better way to, to understand is I am able to be content in any and every situation by the power of the one who is in me. Man, I really love that. I mean, I'm I'm surrounded by discontent, people that don't know the Lord. And I think it's interesting because in our modern age, we have all this talk of like mindfulness and um, different practices and meditative sort of things that you can do to tap into, you know, your inner energy or whatever. But if you, as you say, the natural state yeah. is not to be content, then yeah. no matter how much you tap in, that's never going to change. The yeah. only way it'll change is, as you say, through Christ. There's got to be a the power. There's a power greater than you outside of you, right? Yeah. There's a power that it, that Paul now has received, and it it is really a vestige of, or an early early down payment of resurrection power. Yeah, that I think is that he's on that he's talking about mm -hmm. there. The spirit that, that brought back Christ from the dead lives exactly. in you. Yeah. yeah. But so, just to, so the power yeah. of contentment is amazing. I mean, and and you know, but the basketball shoes, just so like Steph Curry. <laughs> Their, Seth Curry. His Under Armour shoes have this verse on them. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, he if if he would let me with a magic marker, I could wipe out the word "do" and then write "be content." <laughs> be there. content when I, I can, lose games. I can be content, you know, when I have a really sucky game. So. Yeah. 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 I'm I'm content with my forty million dollars annual salary. I don't know about <laughs> you guys, but I'm content oh, with that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> could be better, I guess. Yeah, but, it could be yeah. sixty, but yeah. Yeah. You know, um. Talk to the elders about that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Did but you, I think it's a powerful verse. Oh, think, it's so know. much more powerful that way. Right, it's actually better. Yeah. We improved it. Uh, we improved it. Yeah, yeah. We did it right here. There. At the no, but Paul in. improved it. Paul, we just yeah. had it wrong for a long time. Yeah. Right? I always knew something was wrong, but I'd never really thought to figure out what it was. That this is you not about- You should have had me on the show I earlier. I know. Yeah. yeah. I could have sorted that out for you. <laughs> no, but I think it's much more human, uh, much more uh, incarnational- Mm -hmm. When we think about it in those yeah. terms. Yeah. Uh, so I have several other verses I want to ask you about, okay. but did you have any that you want to make sure we get to? Because, you know, we have limited time and this is like your favorite. So um, is there a verse you're like, man, we got to tackle this one. Well, I mean, I, I love, I love, well, gosh, how, might, how many more things can we say? Uh, chapter one, let me just talk about chapter one real Do quick. Um, chapter one is, 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 is wonderful for, for a lot of reasons. Uh, Paul, a part of the texture of this letter, part of the background of this letter is that Paul has received some sort of gift from the Philippians. Okay? Yeah. Cash money, they, right? They, they've shared Maybe. some money. Right. Yeah. And, and a part of the, and, but Paul, it, what's interesting is Paul says, I recognize that gift and thank you for it, but I really didn't need it after all. And we don't really understand the background of it, but I think here's a, here's a theory that I'm, I'm kind of confident in, fairly confident, is that in Roman jail, uh, unlike American, it's more like third world, majority world country stuff, mm -hmm. uh, lots of bribes are going around. Mm -hmm. So the way, the ticket out of jail was through a bribe. Mm, yeah. And so I think the Philippians uh, figured the, the, out that if uh, we give Paul this much money, that he will pay the bribe. Special handshake. Special mm -hmm. handshake, yeah. and he will get the, his get-out-of-jail mm -hmm. free card. And I think what Paul is saying, no, I'm content to be here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use it, and, and you're going to get credit with God for having given it, mm -hmm. But and I'm going to need it because it, it, to provide his food and maybe other things that he might need. But he wasn't going to do the bribery. But he wasn't going to. He wasn't mm -hmm. going to stoop to bribery because he he had a, an inclination from Jesus that he was to stand before kings right. and emperors. Right. So he he is going to stay the path and and travel all the way. But he but he he says here and one of the first verses I ever memorized when I was a kid was uh, Philippians one twenty one. And it's an easy one for to me to live as Christ hmm. and it's die. Another as one gain. I had on my list. Yeah, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. So Paul is sort of in that mode. He doesn't know if he's going to get released. He doesn't know what's going to happen, but he's working on that power of contentment, regardless of what happens, that he's going to see it for what it is. If I go on living, that is for Christ to live in me. Mm -hmm. And if I die, that is gain. Now, is it gain for him or gain for Christ? 
Well, he's in the mode thinking about the gospel. Mm-hmm. It's, it's going to be gain for the gospel once hmm. I'm dead. In my martyrdom, many people will come to Jesus. In my, mar- in my death, there will be people who come to faith. So I think he's thinking in those terms. Now, he will it's gain himself. It's a win-win. It's a win for him because he gets to be present and with Christ mm-hmm. at that point. But it's also, and we see this over and over again in the history of the church when people are martyred, that there seems to be an outbreak of, of you would expect people to kind of go underground. Mm-hmm. But in fact, it brings people out. Mm-hmm. You know, it brings people out from undercover, and they uh, they become even in fact more more bold. Well, even to this day, it's an apologetic, right? That right. that so many went to their horrifying deaths with full conviction that this was all true. All true is one of the many things we can say. Like this might point to the fact that this is real. You know, right? right. Um, and the, the the thing with the prison and the bribe, yeah. Uh, you know, it, it basically says, you know, this had helped me advance the gospel. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard. So it's, it's kind yeah. of that. Yeah, Paul is yeah. getting Paul is getting a lot of traction in prison. I mean, I, he was apparently a very <laughs> gregarious, outgoing guy, leading his captors to faith and talking about faith in Jesus to those who are yeah. around him. So and and even at the very end of the letter, he he uh, sends a final greeting. It was typical at the end of a letter. To send greetings, you know the my, the people who are here, like acknowledgments, yeah, acknowledgments. <laughs> people with me are greeting you, and as well as you know the the, the imperial guard mm. here are greeting you as well. So there are apparently converts among them, and Paul. That's one of the reasons I think he wants to stay in prison. Yeah, I mean it's not again yeah. not being thrown under the jail. Yeah. it's house imprisonment. People can come. People can write letters with him. Uh, people can bring him food. So I've heard. I've heard it's such a. It's not as bad yeah. a deal. It's not great, yeah. but it's not a, as bad a deal as what he would get later when he's thrown under the under the uh, jail. I've heard sometimes they would have like a guard like handcuffed to you. Yeah. Oh gosh. So kind of. I don't know if I feel bad or good for that guy. Yeah. You know, yeah. He's like you know attached to Paul. And great. Paul's yeah. like talking his head off the whole time. <laughs> but but all, on the other hand, wow, that'd be a pretty cool. That'd be a pretty wait, cool wait, thing. When was he in prison underground? I don't. I've never well, heard I mean, that distinction. Well. Um, what I say underground, he, he in in Philippi, the prison that he was in, he was chained to the wall. Okay. So our assumption is that he and other prisoners. Now he was taken, he was beaten. They didn't know he was a, a Roman citizen, and he could he didn't play that card or didn't have the papers with him exactly at the right time. But um, he he was thrown in that kind of jail mm-hmm. in the city of Philippi. Okay. So they would have sort of known that, but they they would also know that where he is now is a is a different kind of place. Gotcha. That's why they could send the money for the bribe. Okay, and people often died in Roman prison, just died, just simply because. And and, and prison for them was not I'm talking too much about prison. Prison <laughs> for them was not a a sentence. You aren't you don't go before the judge say I'm going to sentence you to a number of years in jail. You were just thrown there until a bribe could be paid, or until you died in some cases. Or until you were moved up the chain to to the next mm. judge, whoever that might be. In Paul's case, he's moving from a judge, and if it is a Roman imprisonment in Caesarea Philippi, to a judge in, in Rome, hmm. where he's getting at least close to the emperor at that point. Mm-hmm. Who, who would have been Nero? Yeah, by this time. I I want to move on to another verse that I I I both love and find it almost impossible and so that way it's it's sort of taxing Mm. in the in philippians 4 it's the um whatever's true whatever's noble that whole yeah yeah, i'm gonna read it um but then i'll i'll ask you and i'll tell you what my sort of problem is with it okay um this is uh chapter 4 verse 8 says finally brothers and sisters whatever is true whatever is noble whatever is right whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And then he says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. It's Mm. such a lovely passage. And I wish Mm. that it was easy to do that. But I guess my question is, well, one, how in the world can we only do that? But two, does that mean we're not supposed to engage with tough things, hard things, um, talk to people in, I mean, I realize it's not saying don't, you know, 
talk to people in suffering because the whole thing is while he's suffering. Yeah. yeah, Um, yeah. But I guess it just, it was used a lot when I, when I was little, not maybe by my own parents, but just the sort of Christian milieu I was in was like, Oh no, 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 no. Don't talk about heart yucky things. Don't. And of course, like don't watch shows that have bad words in them. Don't read things that are. And I think there's a, there's a piece of this that goes to that, but it seems like maybe it's saying more than just like, you know, don't watch a show that has curse words in it. Right. I'm curious just any yeah, of your I, thoughts I, on that passage. I, th- I think well, there's a couple of things going on in this passage. And it, look, look at how that passage ends. Um, what you have learned and received and seen in me, put that mm-hmm. into practice. Mm-hmm. Paul sets himself up as an example for people to follow. Earlier in chapter 3, he says, become imitators of me. Now, that's that's a pretty bold yeah, statement. Is. You know, most of the time we say, don't look at me. You know, don't right. don't make me an example. But Paul knew that we as human beings are sort of hardwired to be imitative mm-hmm. people. The mesis, it's called. We we are we are we imitate. We 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 see someone, we admire them, so we start listening to the music that they listen to. Mm-hmm. We see someone, we admire them, so we start wearing the clothes mm-hmm. that they wear. We see someone, we admire them, we we start speaking like they do. I've had yeah. friends that go. To, on sabbatical, academics go on sabbatical to, to Ireland. They come back with a little bit of an Irish accent, right? Now, this this is just what human beings do. Yeah. And so Paul is setting himself up as an example of a, of, a, of an excellent person. Now, that sounds very arrogant yeah. in a modern context. Yeah. But if you look, go back and look at the ancients, the moralist knew that people were like that, that we needed a flesh and blood example. Hmm. to be able to model our lives. My hope for everybody out there who may be watching this now or in the future would be that they had someone in their lives who was further down the path than they are, mm-hmm. who lived excellent, worthy lives hmm. that they could model themselves on. Yeah. Because it seems like we have people who have a lot of clay feet, hmm. right? It doesn't mean they're perfect. It doesn't mean they always do the right thing. So I think there's something that now late in another letter, Paul says, imitate me because I imitate Christ. So Paul is imitating Christ. And Paul earlier said, have the mind in you, have the same mind in you that was also in Christ. Mm-hmm. So he, he's not putting himself up exclusively. So when you back up, when you start with that and then you back up and you take a look at now, he's he's not he's not saying that you never engage things that are untrue or dishonorable or unjust, right? Mm-hmm. What he's saying is that a part of our mind, for our minds to be conformed, we have times that we need to meditate and to think about and to focus ourselves on taking this unjust world and thinking about how to make it just. Mm-hmm. This dishonorable world and how can we make it honorable. Mm-hmm. This world that lacks excellence yeah, and and then moving that, moving that to... So I don't think he's saying... At this point, don't ever think about those things. Sure. Don't ever talk about those things. I think that is exactly the opposite. It's he said, aim for those things while you're... Aim for that. That's, yeah. the, 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 I, I have in mind a, a rubber band, you know, that's here. And, and the rubber band, I'm pulling the rubber band. As I pull the rubber band, I'm pulling, pulling this as well. Mm-hmm. So I can bear this weight. Um, the tension that we need, if we will focus upon these things, we will be able to see injustice. We will be able to see dis- dishonor yeah. in the world. If we know what honor is, then we can see dishonor when it occurs. Oh, man. Such, so I love, right? I know it's so like cheesy and it's such a sort of youth group trope kind of, but the whole idea of uh, the people, I, and maybe this isn't even true, but people in like the national treasury or I don't know, people at, in the FBI, they will study true currency right. rather than all of the counterfeits. So they'll know what's counterfeit. Yeah. Like instead yeah. of studying all the ways that somebody could do it wrong, they study the real deal so that when something else comes along, they'll know the real deal so well, they can spot the, yeah. the, the false good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I think there's something there's you some, know, the archaeologists that. do the same thing. They oh stu- yeah, they study Ted has real, said this on our. They podcast. study real pottery. They study uh, uh, real coins and those kind of things from the world, so that when they see one that has been faked, and boy, there are a lot of fakes mm-hmm. out there, uh, they can they can spot them. But even the best experts in the world sometimes get tricked. Yeah, I mean, sometimes the best paparologists mm-hmm. 
say, yes, that's a, that's a, I remember Karen King a few years ago at Harvard, you would think, and she had a little, little piece of papyrus. Oh, yeah. It was called the gospel of Jesus, his yeah. wife. Yeah. Oh, and it was about the, that. You know, was that in the Da Vinci code? <laughs> no, it was, it could have been, but, but anyway, it was, it was deemed to be, and it was proven to be, be false. Yeah. But, um, but it made a lot of headlines. But it made a that. lot of headlines and yeah. it fooled a lot of, Papyrologists, mm. people who specialize in knowing that stuff. Yeah. So that's a part of the challenge. Yeah. That's a part of the challenge, and I think we're to be we're to be in that tension between lack of excellence and excellence, yeah. justice and injustice. If we just live all of our lives in justice, you know, how can we help those who are living with injustice? Yeah, man, such good stuff. Okay, let's talk a little bit about, and, and he doesn't spend a ton of time in this, but he does in some of his other books, so uh, all told. In the third chapter, he talks a little bit about false teachers, Yeah, yeah. a warning against false teachers. Yeah. I'm really bad. I don't have it pulled up exactly. Yeah, Philippians um, 3, is towards, let's see. Do, 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 do. Anyway, toward I didn't know if you had any the chapter. thoughts on that. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's sort of toward the end of the chapter. Brother, brothers, he said, join in imitating me. That's kind of how he, he starts that point. And but mark out those uh, who who live as you have an example in us. In other words, I'm not the only example. Mm -hmm. Find your own example, right? As a, as a saying that if you can't see it, you can't be it, right? Mm -hmm. If you, you got to see it in order to be it, and I, I think that's exactly right. But but then he goes, there are many people uh, who live as enemies of the cross. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the challenge. Paul talks about these, these false teachers and these in a couple of places. It's hard to really pin down exactly what he's talking about. Um, in other books, there's the question of Judaizers. Right. Um, people who say that you have to live like a Jew mm -hmm. and then add Christ to that in right. order to, right. That could be part of it because Paul goes on to say th their end is their destruction. Let's see, wait a minute. No, this is that the one I'm looking for. Yeah. Uh, their, their, their God is the belly. That is what they mm -hmm. eat. Verse 19. Yeah, yeah. Their glory is their shame. Now this could be the word shame. There could be a euphemism for male genitalia. Their glory is. I told in their, you there was something juicy here in Philippians. Yeah, okay. there, it could be because he talks about uncircumcision and circumcision, right? right? And <laughs> and that was the sign that a person was Jewish, right? The physical sign, mm -hmm. and 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 their minds are really just set on things of the earth. And then he goes on to this wonderful passage from the false teachers about, but our commonwealth, our palutim, our citizenship is truly in heaven. We await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to change this body mm -hmm. that we have been uh, humbling to be like his glorious body. And that is that is a wonder. So, so Paul is always, when he's talking mm -hmm. about these false teachers, he's always sort of correcting the things that are false. Mm -hmm. in, almost not, not in the same breath, but almost in the same line. He's talking mm -hmm. about what can do that. So we, but but exactly who these people are, how they infiltrated the church, and whether they were a present danger or a future danger, we mm -hmm. don't know. Is he warning us about? Is he warning them? Sorry, about things to come. Mm -hmm. This is one of the challenges that comes from me reading other people's mail. Well, that's what I was right? actually going to ask next. Is that if if all of the epistles are letters, and yeah. often they're in response to something, we can tell that because he'll say like, "I heard so and so is having an argument. Get on that," you know. And so we know they're in response to yeah. things that have happened, things that have been said, whatever. So that there's some onus on us, even though I like the idea of reading scripture for scripture's sake. It's its right. own lens, but then there is some onus on us to look outside of scripture to what was happening historically, culturally, so we can kind of piece together what must he have been talking about, right? right? I think right. there's yeah benefit to doing that. Yeah, there's a cultural background study bible that's yeah, really helpful. I have it. You have that. Yeah, it's a it's a in the notes and in the margins. There's a it tells you a good bit about the culture mm -hmm. because this is this is. 2,000 years old, mm -hmm. right? People have not changed very much. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're still exasperated. We're still lustful. We're still, you know, um, Greedy, you know, unkind, so all the things, you know, yeah. we're angry, all the things that they mm -hmm. were. So human beings haven't changed very much. 
But the culture changes, the language changes, the, the politics around them change. And knowing a little bit about all of that can help us be better Bible readers yeah. and understand that. But there's not really enough information here to say exactly who these people are. Mm -hmm. It could be that they were Judaizers or he's warning them that Judaizers are going, I have been infiltrating my churches and they they're coming for you. They're coming for yeah. you. They're going to be there. They're coming for you too. Well, they sort of, tra they trailed along where Paul was, you know, they knew his route. They knew where he had been. Yeah. Right. Um, and they, Bunch they, of they, they, they went from place to place. Now th in all fairness, they thought they were doing God's bidding. Right. They thought Paul was, was off. Mm -hmm. That Paul's gospel was was not a full and complete gospel. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, that's part of it. No, it's interesting. And maybe part of not knowing exactly who it is can fit for our, when we, as modern readers, when we read it, there are false teachers among us. Absolutely. And um, maybe not knowing these specifics here, it's like, well, then it's whatever the false teaching is. Right. Walk away from that and follow Christ instead. Right. Um, and, and and the point I think that Paul is making in this letter and others like one Timothy is that false teachers are in the church. It's yeah. not that false teachers are out there and you got to avoid them. Yeah, yeah. But they're actually in the church, and and that's a problem. And being able to identify those folks by their teaching, being able to when it's appropriate confront them, mm -hmm. or when it's appropriate walk away. Right, and that gets back to that whole whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is. Right. All, all these things. Like if you right. know that, then you know when something's off. Yeah. So yeah, uh, I, th I think that's that's an that's an important part of the feature of this book, I think. But it's it's hard to pin down in this book compared to Romans, where it's a bit easier. Compared to Galatians, where it's a bit easier too. Um, and and part of this, I think, is the fact <laughs> that Paul didn't write this letter at one sitting. Mm -hmm. I don't think he wrote it. There, there's there's a few times where it seems disjointed. Mm -hmm. And some some scholars think that what we have here is are about three letters that have come together, been put together under, under one cover. Mm -hmm. um, that's possible. But I think it's more likely that Paul is writing one day and then Timothy's got to go. Maybe he's the amanuensis secretary. Yeah, yeah. Or he can't, he can't accomplish it all in one day. Yeah. These things took a long time. Mm-hmm. To do uh, and well, I mean, I've actually had letters from people that are in jail, and right. they, I mean, they're very long because there's not much else to do, right. and they do sort of stop and start. It's like what they're doing that day, or then what they're doing the next day, and but it's great. all in one letter. Yeah, great. Yeah, and so it seems mm -hmm. a little disjointed, right? But you know, because um, you know the circumstances, that's why, right? You know? Yeah, and I think we have to give Paul the the benefit of the <laughs> doubt here that he's writing a single letter, but he's doing so over maybe several days or a sure. week or two and and things are changing uh, yeah. you know and his thoughts are changing yeah on this so. if, if i could ask maybe kind of a big question that we 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 maybe should do a whole episode on so i asked this okay. with the full admission that you, you you you're free to say you know we just need to start For over another time but i mean i'm again thinking about the conversation we had last night that i think will air a week before this airs but basically you know, when when we when we think about Paul's writings and the disjointed nature of it, reminds me of this, mm -hmm. uh, which is we call it the Word of God. Like we appeal right. to Paul as right. speaking for God. Mm -hmm. We speak of Paul as essentially having the same authority mm -hmm. in, in many ways as God. Uh, so when we kind of play Paul off of Jesus, off of the Old Testament, or some other combination of those things, yeah. you know, the 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 Orthodox you know, old man grump in me just wants to be like, look, the word of God says it, it's settled, you know, but other people want to come back and say, yeah, but it's just Paul, you know, Paul was an idiot or what did Paul know? Yeah. What What would you say gives Paul's letters uh, authority? I don't want to say credibility. I think most people agree Paul wrote them. I think mm -hmm. they'd probably agree with his biography, but in terms of being sacred what we would call maybe sacred scripture right what right. would you say what do you have a short answer to <laughs> to what i could uh, say uh, if, no i know? don't have a short answer to that i think it's a complicated question i mean it, there's a reason that these letters were canonized that is made part of the canon the 27 books of the new testament not 24 not 28 but 27 why why these books and i think that there is a sense in the church that that these letters or some sense of credibility, of authority that seem to be beyond. Now, there are churches that that 
would put less stock in what Paul says and more stock in what Jesus said. We right? talked about that some yesterday. Right? Yeah. Um, in other words, we're going we're, we're gonna to do a lectionary reading, and we're going to have the gospel, and we're going to have Paul, and we're going to have Isaiah. Well, we're going to preach on the gospel, right? That's very, very common to do. And I, and I get that. I understand that. But I do see Paul as one who has this special spirit anointing to be able to see the problems in these churches and be able to address them in a pastoral kind, mostly kind, um, but generative way. And so the church got that because maybe we don't get it today because we're 2,000 years removed from it. Mm -hmm. But the Greeks got it. The people who understood the language first got it. And you got to remember the language of the church primarily was Greek for the first couple hundred years, at least. So the people who could read these, to just pick them up and read them, and who knew the culture felt that they had an authority. When we try to stack that against our modern sensibilities about, well, no one should say, imitate me. No one should put themselves on pedestal. You know, don't do what I say, do what I, no, what, what is it? Don't do what I do. Don't, yeah, do what I say, not what I do. Yes, that, that, mm. that thing. I'm a parent, so I'm very You're aware. Parent. Okay. <laughs> we say those kind of things. And then we got this guy named Paul who's saying, Watch me. Yeah. Watch me when I get up in the morning. Watch me as I go through my day. Watch me and listen to what I do. And if you do that, you'll be more like Jesus. <laughs> yeah. And I have heard people say, well, that's incredibly arrogant. But it's because they don't know the culture. They don't know the power of imitation. They don't realize that they, in fact, their lives have just sort of been built on little frameworks of imitation. And uh, when, we, when we see that, we know that. I mean, it's so fun to, to watch that in people's lives as it works out. Yeah. So you would say, I don't want to put words in your mouth, so tell me if I'm right or wrong, Okay. that whether it's the words of Paul or it's the words of Jesus, if we're reading the Bible, yes, uh, that it's the Word of God. It is. Yeah, it is. It is. God speaks through that to us, mm -hmm. and, and God can use that in incredible and important ways. Yeah. I don't so know what don't, book I, of the Bible it is where Paul says that, that phrase about this next part's just for me, Paul. Whenever we get to that yeah. one, we'll have to have First somebody. First Corinthians 7. Oh, okay. Yeah. He, and you're like, what, oh. what he's doing is he's saying, I have, <laughs> on this particular issue. That's the marriage I, issue. I ha yeah. I have a teaching that comes directly from Jesus. So here it is. <laughs> but on this next issue, because other issues developed that Jesus didn't address, this next issue, Jesus never spoke on that that I know of. So, But this is my opinion. Right. Um, I think he's got a part pretty darn good opinion on that because it's been informed by Jesus. It's, he's close to Jesus. He's close to the Spirit. Uh, I, I think I think we need to listen to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We well, got a sneak preview into some Corinthians talk. We haven't figured out who's going to come the on. First and talk Corinthians about that. seven is a fun book in a lot of ways. All right. Well, something to look forward to. Yeah. But we're close nearing the end of our time. If there's any other sort of final thoughts you want to tease out or a verse that maybe you think, I mean, I was going to ask you about the whole, whatever uh, were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Yeah, That's kind of yeah, a tricky one. Right. We only have like three, four minutes. So I don't know if we can yeah. delve into that or. Well, I think, I think Paul is, Paul is, yeah. what's interesting about the letter is that Paul sets Jesus up as this lordly example. Then he talks like, talks about how Timothy is like Jesus. Aww. And then how Epaphroditus is like Jesus by humble mm -hmm. himself. And then Paul in chapter three talks about his own resume. Mm -hmm. And he's and he and, and he's in a sense bragging. Yeah. You know, and in those days bragging was not boasting there was the right way to boast. Right. All right. Uh, and he's talking about, <laughs> well I was born I was uh, circumcised on the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin, a yeah. Hebrew of the Hebrews. When it came to the law, I was blameless. When it came to zeal, I was the first year of the church. So he's, he's Whoa, setting you just did up, all that memorized. It's exactly how it's in there. Sort, yeah. It, it, he's, he's, he's talking about all that. And then he says, I gladly give all of that up, all of my resume. I, I walk away from it. And I humble myself because now I am the one who is seeking to, to, to be like Christ in his suffering. And so Paul understood because of his near martyrdom and later on his real martyrdom that he would be following Christ in ways that you and I maybe never will hmm. because he was truly going the martyr's path. Yeah. And, and so he's saying, I am, I, I, I've, I've walked away from all of that, all of my bragging points, my resume, that, that 
401k. I walked away from all of that. And now I'm following this humble path to follow Jesus. And I, I'm, I'm pressing on to this, to this goal um, in, in my life. I'm pressing on to this upward call to Jesus Christ. So it's, it's a beautiful passage. It's one of the few autobiographical passages yeah. in Paul's letters. He doesn't talk about himself very much. Um, he does more in this letter because I think it's more of a personal letter. It's a friend, what scholars call a friendship letter. Aww. It's bringing people together and talking about their commonalities and ur he's purging them to, to be better friends in a way yeah. than they had been because there was some division and such, as again, there is in all yeah. people. I, I was talking to an archaeologist the other day. He said, wherever you find two archaeologists you'll find you'll have three opinions yes right? i've heard that too. and and it you know you could say that of presbyterians and lutherans and baptists and episcopal you could say it of any group but but in fact that we are a contentious people and so we need the apostles teaching to come along and help us uh, understand it's not we are not to look out for our own interests but for the interests of others not our own opinions but the opinions of others and to follow the example of christ that's what he did yeah and this letter is saying, follow Jesus, right? Yeah. That's the, that's the, ba that's the bottom line. Follow Jesus. I love it. Thank you for coming on. My and talking pleasure. With us about it's a delight. I've been looking if, uh, forward to this for a long time. Oh, yeah. if you, well, you'll have to come back. Uh, if people want to find you and maybe yeah. ask you questions, where, where can people find you? Lanier Theological Library is probably the best. I do a webpage, <laughs> David B, as in boy, David Boy Capes, <laughs> uh, dot com. And I do uh, some. I, I do a couple of podcasts at, for the Lanier mm -hmm. Library. One called the Stone Chapel. Oh, that do, must be named after me, Sarah Stone. Yeah, the Stone Stone Chapel. I was thinking yeah. maybe that's what happened. Yeah. And then I do one with Wheaton College called Exegetically <laughs> Speaking. Now both of those are different. One's seven minutes long. Yeah. Exegetically Speaking is short. Stone Chapel is a little bit longer, twenty minutes. Yeah. We yeah. may do video one day when we get into our new building at the Lanier Library. Come see us though at the Lanier Theological Library. We've For got sure. some great eye candy, Dead Sea Scrolls. <laughs> eye candy. Yeah. I think you define that a little different than the world does. That's true. Yes. Uh, <laughs> eye candy. Okay. We have great artifacts and there great we go. books Whatsoever and beautiful. Things are pure. That's right. That's think right. about it. Yeah. Dead Sea Scrolls. First time ever, maybe that's been called eye candy, but let's go. <laughs> I like it. I'm here for it. Well, uh, if you want any information about uh, Theology on Tap, like I said earlier, go to HoustonTOT.com and you can find out more about me and Evan there or complain about things that you've heard here on the podcast. And um, until we see you again, we encourage you as always to question freely, think deeply, and disagree as needed. Mm -hmm.